Chapter 3 Hyacinth always had her best ideas when surrounded by her favorite things. Scraps of odd-shaped fabric, buttons of many shapes, fat spools of thread and, ra and a rainbow of colors, and paper packets with deadly-looking sewing needles. Hyacinth's yellow paisley dress, her own creation, was made from an old pillowcase with holes cut out for her arms and head. She knotted a wide lavender ribbon around her waist to complete the look. Sitting in the middle of the living room, Hyacinth rummaged through her ribbon collection as she, she tried to think of something to make for the Biederman. It would have to be something so spectacular that he would change his mind about forcing them to move. When Franz, um, when Franz ambled by, Hyacinth took out a piece of green ribbon and draped it over him. His tail wagged about, uh, about a 200 on the WPM, or wags per minute meter. Out of the corner of her eye, Hyacinth spotted her mom leaving the kitchen, disappear into the laundry room, then reappear lugging a stack of, collect of collapsed boxes that had been stored behind the washing machine. But they weren't just regular boxes. They were moving boxes. Hyacinth's bleak mood was interrupted by Franz's happy yowl, followed by the sound of the mail slot opening and a stack of envelopes and magazines dropping under the floor. Hyacinth hopped to her feet and followed Franz to the front door. She rotated the locks and pulled the door open. Hello, Mr. Jones, said Hyacinth. Mr. Jones had been a postman in their neighborhood since before Papa was born. Franz barked twice and snuffled his nose into the mailbag. My friends, Mr. Jones replied, rubbing Franz behind the ears with one hand and giving Hyacinth a high five with the other. He gently nudged Franz's nose out of the way and then took a biscuit from his mailbag and tossed it to him. Franz swallowed it whole and shamelessly rummaged through the mailbag for more. Mr. Jones was dressed in his usual navy blue parka with a USPS Sonic Eagle logo, blue pants, black slip-resistant shoes. Mama had bought those for him after Mr. Jones slipped on a patch of ice last winter and sprained his wrist, and a fur cap, also with the Sonic Eagle logo. Mr. Jones wore a few accessories not sanctioned by the USPS. These were round buttons designed by Hyacinth with help from her button machine. One said, mail rules. Another said, love your postman. And the last one said, dogs are a postman's best friend. The dog one was the hardest to read given the amount of text squeezed onto the tiny circle. And how are we doing today, Miss Hyacinth? Mr. Jones said. We are fine, thank you. Hyacinth said in her most polite voice. Isn't that so nice to hear, Mr. Jones said as he took out a handkerchief and polished the three buttons attached to his parka. Very nice to hear indeed. Hyacinth picked up a small bag of bone-shaped dog treats from the table next to the door and handed them to Mr. Jones. These are peanut butter dog treats, Hyacinth said. If you haven't visited Senor Paz yet, I think that he would like them. Senor Paz was an ancient black chihuahua that lived down the street. I am sure Senor Paz will right appreciate these, Mr. Jones replied, tucking the bag carefully into his pocket. He said sure, the same way Hyacinth said sure, as in seashore. As a matter of fact, he continued, I'm heading that way next. Tell me now, or as a matter of fact, he continued, I'm heading that way next. Tell me now. Did you make these by yourself? Yes, I did, Hyacinth replied, glad he asked. She normally did not offer up this type of information in case it was considered bragging. Mama helped, of course. Your mama sure does have a hand with the baking, Mr. Jones said with an agreeable nod. I don't know what the neighborhood dogs would do without you, Miss Hyacinth. I thought Snuggles had gone to heaven when he tasted the other dog cookie you made. Thinking about Mr. Snuggles made Hyacinth think about her blanket also named Snuggles, which made her think of her bed and her bedroom, which reminded her of the move. Oh, Mr. Jones, Mama and Papa told us the worst news ever today. We're moving. She pulled at the hems of her shirt sleeves and balled the ends into her fists. Mr. Jones's body appeared to shrink a few inches. Move? What move? At that exact moment, Mama skidded into the foyer holding a bag. Hello, she said with a big apologetic smile. Hello, Mr. Jones. I baked some cookies. Would you like some? 
Nothing like double chocolate, chocolate pecan cookies to comfort the tummy and the soul, I always say. Mr. Jones did not reach out for the bag. Now tell me straight, Mrs. Vanderbeeker, are you moving? Hyacinth noticed that Mama also seemed to shrink a little bit. Oh, Mr. Jones, I was hoping to tell you first. Our landlord isn't renewing our lease. We just found out. I've known your husband since he was born, Mr. Jones said, accusation in his eyes. I know, Mr. Jones, you're like a part of our family, Mama said, tears coming into her eyes as she nudged, nudged Franz's nose out of the mailbag and tucked the bag of double chocolate pecan cookies in there instead. We're looking for another place in the neighborhood, Mr. Jones. If you hear of anything, please let us know, Mama said. Mr. Jones went quiet for a few seconds and then said, Mr. Biederman is your landlord? Hyacinth and Mama nodded. Mr. Jones shook his head and glanced up, as if he expected to see Mr. Biederman hanging out his third floor window at that exact moment. Mr. Biederman had some hard times, Mr. Jones said, looking back at them. Hard times. He brought this, bought this brownstone a few months before your family moved in. He used to live a couple of blocks away, right by the college. He worked there. You knew Mr. Biederman? What did he do? Hyacinth asked. He taught in the art history department. He made paintings? He studied art and its history. Who made the art, where and where the, when the artists lived, what techniques they used, and then he taught students about it, Mr. Jones said, giving Franz his final head pat. Well, I best be going. Lots of mail to deliver, Mr. Jones held up the bag Hyacinth had given him, and dog treats to pass out. Have a good day now. He tipped his fur cap and leaned slightly on the bar of his postage cart as he rolled it down away from the Vanderbeeker brownstone and down the street. Mama reached over Hyacinth's head and clicked the door closed and then shuffled back to the kitchen to cook dinner while Hyacinth watched out the window until she couldn't see Mr. Jones anymore. Lainey, the youngest Vanderbeeker, had transformed into her alter ego, Panda Lainey. A furry white coat was dra draped over her stout body and she was crawling around, keeping her mama company in the kitchen. She was the only one who was not so concerned about the possibility of moving. If the Biederman was the only obstacle, Lainey knew, excuse me, Lainey knew she could win him over. She loved people, surely he would love her too. So instead of thinking about ideas to save their home, like Issa had asked, Lainey put all of her attention on getting double chocolate pecan cookies from Mama. On occasion, she pawed at Mama's feet and was rewarded with a carrot. Lainey didn't like carrots so much, too crunchy and too orange, but Panda Lainey loved them. Panda Lainey also loved cookies. Well, Lainey liked them too, and if she was lucky and ate three old carrots, usually a cookie would follow. Pandalini peered around the kitchen island. She spied Paganini, her lop-eared bunny, under the couch. Paganini! Pandalini's, Pandalini said in a loud whisper. One bunny ear twitched, and Paganini's nose moved up and down like a motor. The gray rabbit scooted out from under the couch, and after a suspicious glance in Franz's direction, hopped toward Pandalini's outstretched hand. Paganini loved it when Pandalini came out to play, because that meant carrots. After grabbing the carrots, Paganini dragged it back under the couch and devoured his prize. Pandalini ate the other two carrots with less enthusiasm, then crawled back to her mama's heels and looked up. Okay, you little beggar, mama said with a smile. Just one cookie and bring one to your sister. Her mom passed her two cookies. Pandalini inspected both with a critical eye. One was a little bit larger, but the other was shaped like Paganini. Pandalini debated between them before choosing the larger one and giving the Paganini-shaped cookie to Hyacinth, who crammed it into her mouth and mumbled a gloomy, thanks, without bothering to look up from her ribbons. Jessie, wearing jeans and a baggy navy hoodie, was perched on the steps leading to the dungeon with a pile of colored gumdrops and wooden toothpicks and neat piles around her. She was constructing model molecules by connecting colored gumdrops that were supposed to represent atoms, but she got distracted pretending the gumdrops were the Biederman's eyes, and she was stabbing them with the toothpicks. Issa, 
was down in the basement, positioned at the bottom of the stairs so she could see Jessie. Her violin was cradled on her shoulder, and she was zipping through various etudes, various etudes, short study pieces, short study pieces her music teacher insisted she practice every day. When she finished, she gazed up at Jessie. So, do you have any ideas for saving our home yet? asked Isa. Jessie scowled. Does it look like I have any ideas? Can't you tell I'm in the anger stage of grief? Jess, you've got to pull it together. We need your problem-solving brain. Jessie put down her toothpicks and looked down the stairs. Sorry. I'll totally have ideas when we meet up later. Mama walked by and ruffled Jessie's already disheveled hair. Ideas for what? she asked. Oh, uh, ideas for... Jessie trailed off and looked down at Isa in alarm. Christmas Eve dinner, Isa lied. I'm so glad you guys are taking care of that, Mama said briskly. And don't worry about what everyone has been saying. I'm sure it will be great. Why don't you look up some recipes online? I saw this one recipe for shredded Brussels sprouts with maple hickory nuts that maybe you want to try. Mama passed Jessie your smartphone. It's bookmarked under recipes. Isa shuddered at the thought of Brussels sprouts, shredded or not, and Jessie made a face at the complexity of the recipe. The twins had been responsible for preparing the family meal on Tuesdays since they turned 12 earlier that year. This year, Christmas fell on a Tuesday, and in the Vanderbeeker tradition, Christmas Eve dinner rivaled Thanksgiving dinner in scope and quality. Oliver, not a huge believer in the twins' cooking abilities, suggested that Jesse and Issa have immunity on Christmas Eve, or perhaps that they trade for a different, less important day. Hyacinth agreed with Oliver's suggestion, and even Papa seemed inclined to think that this was a good idea. The twins, offended by the little faith of their so-called family, insisted on keeping to the schedule and vowed to, pr to prove themselves. That is, until they received the news about moving. It's going to be the worst Christmas Eve dinner if we have to move, grumbled Isa. Any ideas for what we should make? And not that Brussels sprouts thing, Jessie added. Isa paused. Anything but turkey. I'm still recovering from Thanksgiving. I will, I repeat, will throw up. Okay, how about this? Jessie set aside the octane gumdrop molecule she had started on and grabbed a piece of paper and a pen. She settled back down on the top step. We could do roasted vegetables for the side dish. We've never messed those up before. At Issa's nod, Jessie wrote roasted vegetables on the list. Okay, main dish. What about beef stew? How hard could that be? Issa nodded again, and Jessie jotted it down. And what to include the meal? And what to conclude the meal with? Jessie murmured to herself. She opened up the search engine on Mama's smartphone and scrolled through some recipes on the cooking website they like to use. She picked two under the heading "Easy Dessert Recipes," sure to impress your guests. What do you think about strawberry cheesecake and carrot cake? Great, Isa said. Add fresh bread from Castleman's Bakery too. Isa started a new etude, making a number of mistakes along the way. Okay, Jessie wrote the final menu on a sheet of paper. The twins went on to the guest list. Miss Josie and Mr. G, of course, Isa said. Oh man, what will they do if we move? Miss Jessie and Mr. G had lived in the apartment above theirs for as long as anyone could remember. Retired, they spent a lot of their time with the Vanderbeekers, and Mama and Papa helped them with the grocery shopping and keeping track of their doctor's appointments and medicines. I don't think Lainey and Hyacinth will be able to leave them, Jessie said. Lainey will latch herself onto Mr. G's leg and refuse to let go. Jessie continued with the guest list, which grew to include the children's favorite relatives, Auntie Harrigan and Uncle Arthur, who lived in Westchester, as well as Issa's music teacher, Mr. Van Hooten. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could get the Biederman to come, Issa mused? If the Biederman ends up at our dinner table, it will be a Christmas miracle, replied Jessie. Issa shrugged and then began playing Sardis by Vittorio Monti, moving to, through to the end of the piece and striking the last note with a flourish of her bow. A familiar scuffling was heard outside. The door to the apartment burst open and in tumbled their dad. Papa took off his coat and hung it up next to the door and then walked across the kitchen to the basement door. Brava, he called down to Isa. A perfect rendition of Sardis. Excellent emotional interpretation. Amazing dynamics. Oh, Papa, Isa rolled her eyes. That was the worst. 
but each time is new, my little violinist. You've never played it exactly that way before. The beauty of live music. He flicked a nickel down the staircase where it bounced off some steps and landed in Issa's violin case. Then he scooped up Lainey and placed her on top of his shoulders. Has anyone seen my Lainey Bean? I've been looking all over for her. I'm not Lainey Bean. I'm Pandalini, the white swath wonder called from above. Ah, Pandalini, my favorite type of panda. Let me see. I don't remember. Are Pandalinis ticklish? Lainey collapsed in a torrent of giggles, and Papa swung her off his shoulders into the ground. Lainey wrapped her arms and legs around his left leg and held on for dear life. Papa half dragged her to where his wife was mixing batter for cheesy bread. The soup pot bubbled on the stove in the fragrant smell of herbs and vegetables drifting through the kitchen. Hello, beautiful lady, he said, dropping a kiss next to her ear. Mama looked him over. Papa still wore his superintendent uniform, an outfit of his own choosing that he insisted on wearing whenever he did building duties. On the bright side, Mama said, if we move, you won't have to wear that jumpsuit anymore. For your information, Papa said, both of his index fingers pointing down at his uniform, these are coveralls. Only the coolest supers wear them. I want coveralls too, Lainey said from the ground, where she still hung on to Papa's leg. See, Papa said to Mama, our daughter has excellent taste. I just don't see why you won't wear your normal clothes to take out the trash, Mama said, pouring the bread batter into two grease loaf pans. Honey, I can't wear my computer clothes when I do stuff around the building. The computer clothes don't have the let's get dirty and fix things personality that my coveralls do, Mama sighed. <sighs> Papa scanned the living room and took in the funereal atmosphere. Issa played a mournful tune on her violin and the brownstone was devoid of the bustle and laughter typical of the Vanderbeeker household. His voice lowered. They're not taking the move well, are they? Mama looked into Papa's eyes. No matter what happened, she said, touching his cheek, I am grateful for the past six years here, she paused, even if you did have to wear coveralls. Papa's smile didn't change the melancholy in his eyes as he reached up to put his hand over hers. Life here couldn't have been better. And that is the end of chapter three. Mm -hmm.